Hello students, welcome back to the science class. In the previous lesson, you know that the living organisms they are surrounded by the thin membrane called as the cell membrane. And the cell membrane functions as to control to the actions of the material such as the nutrients of the waste material from the environment to the cells. So in this unit, we're going to learn about the structures of the cell membranes and the transport. So with that future ado, let's begin our lesson. Cell membranes are structures of contradictions. These oily films are hundreds of times thinner than a strand of spider silk, yet strong enough to protect the delicate contents of life. The cells were through cytoplasms, genetic material, organelles, and all the molecules it needs to survive. How does the membrane work and where does that strength come from? First of all, it's tempting to think of a cell membrane like the tight skin of a balloon, but it's actually something much more complex. In reality, it's constantly in flux, sifting components back and forth to help the cells take in food, remove waste, let the specific molecules in and out, communicate with other cells, gather information about the environment, and repair itself. The cell membrane gets this resilience, flexibility, and functionality by combining a variety of floating components in what biologists call a fluid mosaic. Fluid mosaic model describes the structures of a plasma membrane as a mosaic components, including phospholipids, cholesterol, proteins, and carbohydrates as a fluid characters. Fluid means both of the phospholipid and the proteins can move about by the deficiencies. Mosaic describes the pattern produced by the scattered protein molecules when the surface of the membrane feed from above. The primary component of the fluid mosaic is a simple molecule called a phospholipid. A phospholipid has a polar electrically charged head which attracts water and a non-polar tail which repels it. There are a few points you need to remember about the fluidity of a cell membrane. First, the more unsaturated the tails, the more fluid the membrane. Unsaturated fat acids are bent and therefore fit more loosely. Second, the longer the tail, the less fluid the membrane. Third, as the temperature decreases, membrane becomes less fluid. They pair up tail to tail in two layer sheets just 5 to 10 nanometers thick that extends all around the cells. The heads point in towards the cytoplasms and out towards the water fluid external to the cells with the lipid tail sandwich in between. This bilayer, which at body temperatures has the consistency of vegetable oil, is studied with other types of molecules including proteins, carbohydrates, and cholesterols. Cholesterols keep the membrane at the right fluidity. It also helps regulate the communications between the cells. Sometimes, cells talk to each other by releasing and capturing the chemicals and proteins. The release of proteins is easy, but the capture of them is more complicated. That happens through a process called endocytosis, in which sections of the membrane Engulf substances and transport them into the cells as vesicles. Once the content have been released, the vesicles are recycled and returned to the cell's membrane. Besides that, cholesterol has the following functions. First, stabilize the cells at higher temperatures. Second, prevent the membrane quickly break and cell burst open or for the mechanical stability. The most complex components of the fluid mosaic are proteins. One of their key jobs is to make sure that the right molecules get in and out of the cells. Nonpolar molecules like oxygen, carbon dioxide, and certain vitamins can cross the phospholipid bilayer easily. But polar and charged molecules cannot make it through the fatty inner layer. Transmembrane proteins stretch across the bilayer to create channels that allow specific molecules through, like sodium and potassium ions. Peripheral proteins floating in the inner face of the bilayer help anchor the membrane to the cell's interior scaffolding. 
There are two types of proteins in the cell membrane. First, intrinsic proteins or integral proteins, which is found embedded within the membrane. Second, extrinsic proteins or peripheral proteins, which is found in the inner or outer surface of the membrane. There are other structures in the cell membrane, which are glycoproteins, the combinations of the carbohydrates and proteins. Second, the glycolipid, which is the combinations of carbohydrates and lipid. Glycoproteins and glycolipid are used as the circuitry coating to the cells, which is known as the glycocalyx. In animal cells, mostly involve the glycoproteins, while in the plant cells, mostly involve the glycolipid. Below are the functions of the glycoproteins and glycolipid. First, to stabilize the membrane structures. Second, to act as receptor molecules. Third, to act as the cell marker or antigens. As we know, glycoproteins and glycolipid act as receptor. There are three major groups of receptor. First, signaling receptors are used to coordinate the activities of the cells. Second, the endocytosis receptors are used to help the engulfing of the cell surface membrane by binding to the molecules. The last one, the cell additions receptors, are used by binding to the other cells in tissues and organs of the animals. Proteins in the cells mostly act as the transport proteins. There are two types of transport proteins, first channel proteins, second carrier proteins. Besides helping the transport of the substances in the cells, proteins may also act as enzymes and they may also act to maintain and decide the shape of the cells or known as the cytoskeleton. I think that's all about our lesson today. Don't forget to do the SSS on my mother. Bye!